Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, How to Reduce Turnover with Employee Assessment. This event is being presented by HR Morning and is sponsored by eSkill. My name is Tyrone and I will be your moderator for today's 60-minute event. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box in the control panel. If they're regarding the subject being presented, I'll add them to the queue for questions at the end. Please remember that it is a violation of our copyright to record the conference. Now I'd like to introduce your speaker, Max Mueller. Hello everyone. Let me add my welcome to our presentation today. Before we get started, I also want to do a couple of logistical things. Um, as uh, uh, Tyrone said, uh, we're going to run for 60 minutes. Um, I'm going to do my very best to limit my presentation in chief to about 45 minutes, leaving 15 minutes for Q&A. However, this is a big topic, and um, I might run a little bit long, run into the uh, Q&A time. And if that happens, or well, and, and being, you know, the result of which is you didn't have a chance to ask a question that you wanted to ask during the, uh, the time frame. Uh, or if later today, tomorrow, whenever something pops into your head and you go, oh, gosh, I, I really wish I would have asked that question. Um, you know, don't hesitate to email me. My uh, email is on the screen in front of you. It's max at maxmuellerassociates.com. Uh, do notice that my last name even though it's pronounced uh, Mueller, it is spelled like Muller. Uh, also, um, later on, I'll give you the uh, email of our sponsor, eSkill. And if you have some very specific questions about the nature of the assessment tests that we're going to be discussing today, um, you might want to direct those to, to uh, our sponsor. All right. Now, having said that, let me begin by just talking about, you know, what pre-employment assessment tests are and, you know, their role in, in, you know, preventing turnover, getting the right hire the first time and things of that nature. Generally speaking, they're an objective, standardized way of gathering data on candidates during the hiring process. And I hope you notice, I, I slow down my rate of speech because I really want you to lock in on the words that I'm using. These tests, these assessments are objective. They um, try to get rid of as much subjectivity as po uh, you know uh, as possible, and uh, again concentrate on things that are you know measurable, definable, etc. They're also standardized, and that way every applicant basically is asked the same questions in the same way, whether it's on computer, written, you know what, whatever it happens to be that the presentation is the same. Now, obviously, we're all different. People take in information in different ways. They process information in different ways, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's not that everyone is going to get the exact same meaning from the very same words or the very same media in which the uh, data is presented, but still in all, at least it's standardized and what have you. Now, I'll tell you what I've always found interesting about these things, and everyone, I've been dealing with HR matters since 1974, and um, uh, some of you know from reading the literature about this webinar, I am an attorney, and I'm also the author of the Sherm published book, um, The Manager's Guide to HR. So I've been dealing with this stuff for a long, long time. And again, one of the things that's really impressed me about these uh, types of tests, these assessment tests, is that all of them, all of these professionally developed and well-validated, another key concept, well-validated pre-employment assessment tests, they all have one thing in common. They're an efficient and a reliable means of gaining insights into the capabilities and traits of prospective employees. Now, depending on the type of test being used, uh, these assessments can provide, you know, really strong, relevant information uh, that is somewhat predictive, all right? Um, and I, I'm not sure I, I love the word predictive because that almost seem, seems as though uh, I'm suggesting that there's like this absolute certainty of an outcome, um, you know, as far as predictability on, on whether or not someone's going to be successful or not. I, I think that they're more of a very strong indicator, all right? And, and I, I'm not trying to in any way, um, you know, speak badly of them, but I, I think strong indicator, very strong indicator, is um, a, a little bit more of, a, of an appropriate thing. Now, for ease of presentation, I am going to keep using the word predictability, predict, and so on and so forth, but please, I want to temper that with, uh, you know, nothing is perfect, all right? Now, 
I think it's important to uh, think about the nature of these things because turnover is incredibly time consuming and expensive. And you know, if, if it really experience like any real high turnover of any type, it really gets expensive. Let me share a couple of uh, kind of national statistics with you. And um, on the screen, I've got two sets of numbers. One of them is from the Society of Human Resource Management, SHRM, uh, which I think you all know is the uh, largest trade association in the world dealing with human resource matters. And the other one is Glassdoor, a well-known you know, uh, organization in the HR world. And notice the similarity in their numbers in terms of you know, how expensive turnover is. Uh, according to SHRM, the average cost to hire an employee is $4,129, and it takes 42 days to fill a position. And I want to talk about that time to fill a position because there's two different ways of measuring that. There's time to hire and there's time to fill, and I'll, I'll return to that theme in just, just a second here. But all right, now contrast that and, and notice really kind of the similarity to a large extent. Uh, between the numbers I just gave you and those from Glassdoor. The average company, according to that organization, the average organization spends $4,000 to hire a new employee, and it takes up to 52 days to fill the position. That is, there isn't much difference there. Certainly in, in terms of money, it, it's negligible. I mean, they're both basically saying $4,000. And, you know, whether it's 42 days or, or 52 days, that is a long time to have an open position where you're either hiring temporary workers, you're distributing the uh, the work of the uh, empty position among other people, you're incurring overtime, uh, there's internal um, the administrative costs associated with it and so forth. And you know, depending on the profit margin of your organization, think of how much money it, uh, it, that you have to generate in terms of selling your goods and services to generate $4,000 pre-tax. In other words, take a 10% profit margin. You'd have to generate $40,000 to net out, again, pre-tax, $4,000, which you then would spend on just simply trying to hire some back in. If your profit margin was 15%, you'd have to generate $27,000. Now, even if you had a higher, you know, uh, you know, percentage that, that you're getting out of your goods and services profit margins. Even at 25%, you'd still have to generate $16,000 in order to get $4,000 net, which you then would spend on simply trying to hire somebody in. And so if you multiply that number times, you know, however many uh, people you're experiencing turnover with or positions, if you will, um, it's terrible. I mean, really, it really is when you actually look at the, the real costs. Now, a minute ago, I mentioned something about, you know, uh, time to hire versus time to fill. And if you don't already know your own numbers, I, I really would urge you to take a look at this. I think this is an important thing to sort of have on your HR dashboard uh, on the things that you're measuring in terms of, you know, revenue per employee and, and days uh, absenteeism and, you know, all that. Now, the, the, the time to fill sort of thing falls into what's called the vacancy rate. It's, um, you know, basically how long it takes to fill things up, you know, when, when you have a vacancy. But there's two ways of measuring it. You know, it's kind of your, your, your starting point. Generally speaking, the terms time to fill deal with how long your entire recruitment process is, from creating a new job opening to actually hiring someone. Now, time to hire is a, a different starting point. It's after you already have candidates that, that, you know, that you've either sourced yourself or have applied for a job. How many days does it take to hire someone? Now, you really do need to know both of those. The longer they go, common sense dictates it costs you more money. You, you, you start climbing to that $4,000 average and above. And so once again, if you don't know that that, that that those numbers, if you will, plural, um, I really, really urge you to uh, to take a, a hard look at it. All right, I really do. And one of the real benefits of pre-employment assessments uh, is that they they shrink the time frame. They they really do. They 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 shrink the time frame. And 
you know, these tests have become increasingly popular because they, they allow you to filter and manage a fairly large applicant pool. You know, doing this manually uh, for my clients over the course of the years, uh, when I'm dealing with, you know, HR you know, matters, when I'm acting as a consultant, uh, I have a kind of a paper version of a, uh, uh, of a sheet that you use to screen people out. And basically it's just, you know, it's a matrix, it's a spreadsheet. And uh, what you have running down uh, the left-hand column, the rows, if you will, uh, are the different, uh, you know, sort of skill sets uh, and, and competencies that uh, the organization is looking for. And it isn't everything, but, you know, it's a fair representation of the things that are of the most interest. Now running along the top, the, the columns are the individual applicants. Now, I try when doing this manually, and of course, when you do this electronically, it's even easier to to, to shelter uh, uh, people from uh, you know putting in implicit bias. Um, to get rid of implicit bias, in other words, um, let us say that we have uh, a number of names that are uh, Anglo-Saxon names, and then we have a number of names uh, that are um, you know uh, Hispanic or um, uh, from uh, you know. Uh, Africa or whatever, and so they're not the traditional Anglo-Saxon sounding name. They're from India or whatever the case might be. And so to actually at the top of the column, to have the name of the applicant uh, uh, also, well, not, not almost, it actually does raise the specter that the reviewer, the screener, is going to, uh, you know, act on on really even biases that they don't even know they have, and they'll start overlooking good candidates. And so, to avoid that, um, in this this sort of manual approach, if you will, at at the top of the column, it would be applicant one, applicant two, applicant three, and then of course you'd have the designation on the actual, you know, forms themselves. And so, the thing to do then is you have a legend uh, that indicates plus means they have the skill. A dash means they have a related skill. A zero might mean they, they don't possess the skill at all and all that. And so it is a way of taking a large applicant pool and then screening it basically manually, uh, but it, it, it really cuts down the time it takes to do it. Now automate that. Automate that whole idea. And that's what you end up with here where, you know, uh, you can filter a very large uh, applicant pool very, very quickly electronically. And, you know, I think this is really an important concept, you know, this, this speed of, of review and, and um, you know, non-discriminatory screening, because the internet's made it, you know, easy. I mean, really, really easy for job seekers to apply for all kinds of jobs. And I recently saw a, a study that uh, estimates that there's over 250 resumes and applications that are submitted for every corporate job opening. And I think we all know that, you know, out in the world now, you've got basically resume scammers, uh, spammers, or I mean scammers, spam, spammers. <laughs> and what they do is they distribute their resumes across the way, uh, the web in blasts. And they really don't pay much attention to the required qualifications. And, you know, in my own life experience, and again, I've been dealing with HR matters for many, many years. And, you know, I mentioned one of the books I wrote, another book I wrote for the American Management Association is called The uh, Legal Side of HR Practice. And so, um, you know, I've been dealing, as I say, with this for a long time. And I've come to learn just from my own experience, plus, you know, things that I've read, that applicants, when they're looking at a job description, a job uh, uh, advert, they spend like like less than two minutes looking at it. And so if they see something like, you know, um, do, do you know Excel? They'll say yes. They won't read the fine print that says that, no, we're not just looking for someone that knows Excel. We're looking for someone that can create multiple spreadsheets that when you update the information in one, uh, then it updates the same data in all the other spreadsheets at the same time. And more often than not, because people don't read something like that carefully, what you end up with is someone who, yeah, they can use Excel, but very, in a very rudimentary way. You know, they, they can pull up an existing spreadsheet and repopulate the cells, but they can't really do anything much more beyond that. All right. And, you know, it, it's really not a surprise that, you know, uh, many, many, many job applicants don't even have the most basic qualifications for things they're, they're uh, you know, 
applying for. And so, you know, I know, uh, because I've been doing this as I say for a while now, um, I don't have time and my clients don't have time to thoroughly read every resume. And they're going to spend just a very few seconds or look for keywords, key concepts, and then you're on down the road. And so, uh, again, by doing this electronically, it speeds up the process. It's far, far more thorough. And you end up hiring smarter and firing less for sure. But also by hiring smart on the front end, you have a lot less turnover. All right. Now, let's think about traditional methods um, that, that really don't do, you know, sort of pre-employment um, you know, assessment tests beyond people. They don't front load it. They back load. If they do some testing like this, they back load it. And obviously my, my premise is that you need to front load it to, um, you know, really kind of call the applicant pool very, very quickly. So let's contrast what I'm talking about against traditional recruiting. First of all, there has to be a perceived need to either create a new position or that a vacancy has occurred and now the question becomes is it worth it to to fill the position or should we actually distribute the uh, the tasks among the existing work group uh, and a lot of times of course that's going to happen if you're trying to to downsize through normal you know uh, uh, attrition normal you know people leaving the organization retiring and, and what have you you don't want to fire anyone but you want to downsize you know slowly and methodically and and all of that so there's that so the first thing is just the recognition do we need someone the next thing is to determine you know do we have a job description that is accurate that actually captures the both the the intellectual the personality things required for the job and the functional skill sets that it takes to be successful in that position so we go through this whole thing of someone you know writing a, a job description or trying to bring it up to date it has to be vetted there there's there, there's discussions and meetings and you know on and on and on so finally we end up with this this product now we have to put it out on job boards and newspapers uh, you know uh, uh, on our website on and on and on then we have to wait some period of time you know we have this this opening we want to get the largest applicant pool possible so now there, there's some time involved in that then uh, again we're talking basically you know the a, a manual approach to this sort of thing and so now we've got to do uh, maybe some pre-screening on the phone, and so that might be uh, uh, a you know someone that simply calls up to do fact checking. You know, uh, I see here you went to XYZ school, and you know, is it true? And when were you available? And so all the the pre-screening questions um, and and so forth. It could be that um, depending on you know the nature of your own uh, enterprise and how you intellectually approach these things. You might actually be uh, getting a um, you know, credit check on someone, a background check, and so all of that you know, takes time. Uh, you have to comply with the uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act and on and on and on. <clears throat> so now we've got this applicant pool. So now you have to decide, are we going to do a telephone interview? Uh, are we going to do a telephone interview that also you know, um, uh, is, uh, has a video you know, feature to it? Um, are we going to bring the person in? Is it going to be a single interview? Um, are we going to, you know, move it down uh, stream a little bit and then have more people do it? And this just goes on and on and on. Then we offer someone a job. Um, they they accept it. Then then they find a better job and they don't show up. And then we have to go back. And it goes on and on and on. I don't need to go any further. I know you actually, you know, capture the 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 idea. The thing is, though, a lot of times the traditional method fails, and it fails because the questioner is inexperienced in interviewing all too often all right we've got an interviewer that um, uh, has no experience no training has never really thought about the questions and all that <clears throat> or even thought about why am i asking this question what do i hope to get, gain by it and i'll tell you something as a lawyer if you don't need to know the answer to something 
uh, you know, to make a hiring decision, don't ask the question because you're going to take yourself into, you know, unsettled waters because almost certainly you'll end up asking something that someone's going to perceive to be discriminatory in terms of race, religion, age, sex, physical disability, um, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, marital status, and every other, you know, protected class in the world. And so questions like, Tell me about yourself. You know, on the front end, that seems like that's a, a nice, you know, question. Give the person a chance to talk about themselves. But then right away, they start giving you information you really rather they, they wouldn't say. Someone says, well, you know, when I came in here, I'm sure you noticed that I'm over 40 years old. You know, it's really hard for a person my age to get a job these days. So, boy, did you really want to hear that? Well, you're the one that said, tell me about yourself and what have you. So you didn't ask a focused question. How about one like this? Where would you like to be five years from now? You know, you know, there's always, of course, the the immediate thing that pops into everybody's head. Well, I'd like to be sitting in your chair, making your salary. You know, let's let's trade bank accounts and all that. Or, you know, one of my favorites that I've heard people ask <clears throat> is, "Are you a team player? What do you expect someone to say in response to that?" No, I'm not. I hate people. You know, I, I, I you know, I, I. I, you know, I'm kind of a curmudgeon. I, uh, I, I'd really rather have a job where I worked uh, the graveyard shift and worked all alone, to tell you the truth, you know, sort of thing. What are they supposed to say? Of course they're going to say I'm a team player. Oh, I love people. I'm the person in high school that everybody told their secrets to. I'm just that kind of a person and on and on. It, again, it's unformed. It's unstructured. And unfortunately, that is, uh, you know, has been the norm for many, many, you know, many, many years. Now, Things in recent years have gotten better because people have come to understand that behavior-based, and it's also called performance-based interviewing, it's called competency-based interviews or targeted selection type questions, are better still. Now, before I go on, obviously, I, and, and look, you can project forward. You know that this is a buildup for me to extol the virtues of, in fact, doing pre-employment, you know, standardized assessment testing. Of course, that's where I'm going with this. But don't overlook what I'm saying right now, because this isn't just some sort of little history lesson. In talking about behavior-based interviewing, this introduces the idea that how someone has conducted themselves and handled themselves in the past and the knowledge they've picked up in the past is an indicator of how they're going to perform in the future in similar situations. So if I formulate a question that says, tell me about a time when you, and then the rest of that sentence deals with a pain point that my organization has, all right? Yeah, you know, an, an actual thing that this person is gonna deal with in my environment, I wanna know how they've handled a similar situation in the past. So tell me about a time, describe when you, have you ever, uh-huh, then how did you? What specifically was your role? Now, I, I understand that you X, Y, Z. Now, tell me what your thinking was. How, how did you process that information? So it's very hard for the applicant to make up some cute storyline, all right? Now, look, people these days, that, that have the, the, the time, the money, and, and, and the, the interest in getting ready for interviews, they have all been told, and I've told this to clients as well, they've all been told you need to have two or three life stories that you can use in any interview and that you can turn around to your advantage. So that if, if someone asks you the question, tell me about your greatest failure, you are ready to go, you roll out one of these stories, you talk about your greatest failure, and then you immediately segue into your greatest accomplishment, where you say, but you know what I learned from that greatest failure? Uh, it led me to my greatest success, which was, and then you tell it that way. If the, the questioner asks it the other way around, you know, tell me about your greatest success, so you roll that out, but then you preempt them from asking what was your greatest failure, because you say, I could not have achieved that success were it not for my greatest failure, blah, 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 blah. So people are ready to rock and roll with these stories. But if you have these focused questions about, uh, you know, skill sets, you know, demonstrate, tell me about, explain to me and all that, those are far more, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot more success hiring the right person. So take that concept and imagine organizations that have formulated these tests 
that delve deeply into different functional skill areas. Now, not just personality. I'm, I'm not dismissing personality tests at all because that's part of the, the package here. But it's these functional things. You know, when did you, how did you, you know, what do you know about this? Can you list for me? And so forth. And so um, uh, all of the, all of it's important. You, you know, you know, the functional skills, uh, uh, you know, the cognitive skills, they're very, very important just as are the personality ones are. And so behavior-based interviewing focuses on questions that delve into the applicant's past behaviors as they relate to the job in questions. And so uh, it, it's, you know, really what have you done versus what you might do. Now, truly, over the course of the years, um, I have done, you know, a lot of training, um, um, done a lot of webinars, et cetera, on this behavior-based interviewing issue. And constantly, a question arises, where can I find a list that has those questions? Well, everyone, there, you know, you can search the internet and you can find pieces and parts, but the the organizations, you know, like, like our sponsor today, eSkill and others, they have actually developed individual, very deep dive questions that delve into these various things. And that's why I say this concept is so very important you know, what's happened before, what's their base of knowledge, what would that mean in the future? Now, gradually, uh, more and more people have, in fact, added video to the initial screening uh, uh, process, and this could be part of the pre-screening assessments, uh, as well as, you know, fill in the blank tests, uh, you know, uh, you know, essay tests, so on and, and so forth, all right? Now, I will tell you, that again, based on on some you know numbers, and th these numbers are from the American Management Association, that in today's world, pre-employment uh, skills testing, assess you know pre-employment assessments, really are the way to go. Uh, you're going to have a much you know more successful hiring rate, uh, success rate, less turnover, and all that. And so, um, based on what the AMA has out there, 70% of employers now in fact do some sort of job skill testing. 46% of them do use personalities and or, all right, so it's one or the other or both together, psychological tests on applicants or on their current employees. Now, let's not forget our current employees because they're going to come back up here in my little dialogue in just a minute because let, let me kind of pre-call something. How do you create a baseline of, of competency? How do you decide, you know, what is a, you know, a, a passing score, an acceptable score on any test? You have to have some sort of baseline. There has to be some sort of a cutoff point. And we don't want it to be arbitrary. We don't want it to just be, you know, a, a default. You know, a lot of, you know, standardized tests, they will have some defaults. You know, 70% is a passing grade, 80% is a passing grade. The, there are these defaults. But are, is that really tied to your organization, to your reality, to your expectations and desired outcomes and all that? Not necessarily. And so, again, we're going to come back to our current employees and their body of knowledge and their performance issues in just a minute. Now, 41% of employers do test applicants based for, you know, for their, their basic literacy and math skills. Okay. Now, it's widespread. It's useful. Now, the benefits, all right, let me, let me kind of, you know, summarize some of the things that I, I, I've said in a more general manner. These pre-employment assessments, they do, as I've already said, efficiently screen out, you know, or screen rather, large pools of applicants. And they do uh, the assessment in an objective and an accurate manner uh, because they're, these tests are validated, all right? They do ensure that the person is able to perform the essential functions of their positions. Maybe not all the peripheral tasks, but the essential ones, the core ones, you have a pretty good idea whether or not someone can do it based on their responses, all right? Unless, obviously, unless they're just, you know, falsifying everything. Now, this also, because these tests are validated, they're going to help you comply with legal requirements like, you know, safety sensitive positions. And uh, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, adverse impact discrimination in just a moment. And again, let me kind of pre-tease this a little bit, uh, uh, tease forward. Um, adverse impact is where you have a facially neutral 
policy or a practice. It seems to apply to everyone equally. But then when you put it into effect, you actually are doing it, it has a disproportionate negative impact on one or the other protected groups. It, it um, you know, uh, screens out, uh, uh, you know, an unusual number of uh, women, um, you know, uh, 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 people of color, uh, you know, whatever the case might be, all of a sudden, even though it looks neutral on its face, it's not. All right, I'll, I'll come back to that. Also, this helps you actually match applicants and employees with suitable positions. You know, where, where are their greatest strengths? Uh, uh, and in, in terms of talent management and skills development and internal, you know, uh, learning process and training, uh, you know, uh, topics and so forth, it helps with all of that. It does address, you know, various and sundry safety concerns. But again, I'm going to tease ahead. Be careful here. Before you've conditionally offered someone a job, you cannot ask them a question in writing, verbally, however it might be that would almost certainly reveal that they have a disability, all right? So, you know, let, let's be careful on the uh, on the uh, safety concerns sort of a thing there uh, in terms of the questions that we put forward, all right? And then, you know, again, basically, because th this is also quick and, and, and easy and all that stuff, uh, it certainly cuts down on the time and the expenses of recruiting and hiring. Now, there are risks. Um, associated with all of this and and uh, you know it would not be truthful on my part to ignore the risks first of all again there is the danger of adverse impact there really is and, and in fact i'm going to go ahead because now that i've raised the topic twice let me go ahead and expand on it just a little bit here for a minute um everyone adverse impact again is where you've got a facially neutral policy that when it's put into practice it has a, uh, a, a mathematically adverse impact on a protected group. And um, the easiest example I can think of is, let's say that we have a, an organization where the workforce really uh, is, is somewhat kind of uh, homogenous in terms of its makeup. Let us say that 98% of uh, the group is uh, made up of uh, women. And so this organization, in my, my example here, hires by word of mouth. In other words, they, they don't, uh, you know, advertise uh, externally. They, they post internally and they, they run around. They say to everyone in the organization, uh, we have this new position or we have a vacancy coming up. Can you recommend someone? <clears throat> well, everyone, obviously, if 98% of the people they're asking, you know, for a recommendation uh, uh, is from a, a, a particular group in my example all women you're gonna get more women all right which even though it, it seems to uh, be fine you know hiring by word of mouth internally doesn't seem to you know on purpose uh, discriminate against anyone obviously it discriminates against all men let's add some other you know wrinkle to it let us say that we have 98% all white men well who are you gonna hire more white men and so and so it goes and so once again one of the really you know dangerous things about you know this kind of testing is to make sure that these tests are validated that they are related to the job in question and uh, they 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 uh, uh, you know fairly measure everyone then of course you do have this uh, the ADA uh, you know uh, issues the Americans with Disabilities Act now another thing in terms of the risks of doing this pre-employment uh, assessment testing by front loading it is is it worth it financially and in terms of your time if you have a low turnover rate it might not be worth the time and money now here comes a huge however however and i'm bold facing the word however there's flashing lights there's music playing in the background it really depends on the positions that you're looking for you know if you have a very technical position or you're trying to hire upper uh, an upper management type of an individual then in fact even if the only you know use this kind of testing you know once or twice per year you know or, or you know some sort of really very periodic basis it could very well be that from a qualitative standpoint because you, you get such a, a better candidate and, and what uh, out of the deal um, and a better hire eventually it could very well be that once again, even though 
you're only uh, using this on a periodic basis, it may in fact still be worth the investment of time and money in this resource. All right. Now, another danger is that some people just don't test very well. All right. And um, uh, they, they also might be get, you know, uh, scared off. You know, it, it, so uh, it could well be that if someone knows that they were going to have this test, that um, it might discourage them from joining the initial applicant pool. Um, uh, and by the way, you, you know, you, there's always the danger, especially when people are, are filling these things out remotely or doing it from home and all that, of fraud, that they've got their, their genius buddy, you know, with the 500, you know, IQ or whatever uh, to do the thing for them. And so one of the things that you might do is make sure that in, in your advertising literature and in your job advert that uh, you make it clear that uh, there might be or there will be retesting, you know, in-person testing downstream so that someone doesn't in fact try to be cute and have somebody else fill out the test for them on a pre-employment basis. Now, another danger is if you are going to use these uh, tests on current employees, it may have uh, uh, an impact on morale where someone either has been doing or at least in, in their mind they feel like they've been doing not just an adequate job, they've been doing a great job, they, they believe themselves to be a rock star, and then all of a sudden they do terrible on this test. So I don't know, it, it, it's at least something to consider. At least it's something to consider. But I, 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 I've already kind of given away, you know, kind of let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. In terms of finding cutoff points, uh, one of the best ways to do it is to use these tests on current employees to find out how they score on them and um, you know adjust your your testing procedures and the very questions you ask to that. Also, uh, finally, one of the other dangers is making your managers angry. It, it, it's like, yeah, I, I had no hand in making the decision. They just gave a bunch of the, these tests, and I've got this 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 person that yeah, I guess they scored high on the test. But they're absolutely incompetent, and they're they're just as negative as can be. They they just spread negativity around them, uh, you know, uh, and what have you. And I, I wish I'd had a, a chance to say something about this. I sure wouldn't hire that person. So there there is that risk as well. All right. So the bottom line on that last point is this testing should be part of an overall package. It shouldn't be the the end all be all of making your decisions. Now, in terms of the different types of tests, all right, there's a lot of different things. They, they generally, though, break down. Again, there's all kinds of these tests. And on my PowerPoint, you can see that, you know, there's psychological personality tests and aptitude tests and physical and drug tests and fitness tests and, you know, on and on and on. Okay. The thing is, they generally fall into three uh, kind of overarching categories. There are aptitude tests, there are personality tests, and there are skill tests. And that's the, the terminology I'm most uh, familiar with in the HR world, maybe for the very same concepts, people might use other words, but again, aptitude, personality, and skill. Now the aptitude tests measure critical thinking and problem solving and the ability to learn, uh, the ability to digest and apply new information. Uh, basically, cognitive aptitude tests um, you know, kind of suss out uh, someone's general intelligence and brain power. And, you know, that's kind of important, you know, rather than just, you know, the personality thing. Because, you know, LinkedIn did a study, and uh, it, according to the study they did, that the two most important qualities that, that employers generally seek are number one, problem solving, and number two, the ability to learn new concepts. And you know, those abilities really are difficult to assess based solely on resumes and interviews. And that's where these aptitude tests can help because, you know, they can be used in almost any occupational context, all right, because they're, they're, they're really, you know, looking at, you know, again, how does this person process information? Can they solve problems? And are they, you know, willing to learn and do they have the capability of learning new concepts and then of course then putting those uh, into use and, and, and what have you. And so um, those things are important in a variety of fields and so um, aptitude tests are, are really pretty important. Now let me bring back up personality tests because again I, I don't want to minimize those. I really don't. Um, uh, they're important, all right? 
you know, will the candidate be comfortable here? Will other people be wor you know, comfortable working with the candidate and, and what have you? And so um, it, it basically, um, it deals with the things that are behavioral traits, the things that are going to, you know, be with that person like forever. And um, in, in the HR world, um, these kinds of tests uh, look at these, the, what are called the big five or the five factor model uh, of, of uh, these things. And, and so there are these five dimensions of personality that, that these various things test. There's agreeableness, there's conscientiousness, there's extroversion, there's openness to experience, you know, to new things, and then there's stress tolerance. So, you know, agreeableness, conscientiousness, extroversion, openness, and stress tolerance. So that's what that measures. And again, all important. And then finally, uh, under kind of the general rubric, kind of the umbrella of what a skill test is, it, it simply measures job-related competencies. And it, it's broad things like verbal skills and math skills and communication skills. It also uh, they, they measure narrow things like, you know, speed of data entry, you know, typing skills, if you will, and, um, you know, general computer skills. And um, these are the kinds of things that people have picked up through education and their experience uh, and what have you. And they don't necessarily reflect basic aptitude, but it's it's really acquired knowledge, all right? And and um, you know, the physical things, it's muscle memory. You know, someone picked up, you know, the, the, the skills to do something that, that are of a physical, maybe repetitive nature and how well they, they do that, okay? And so general skill tests basically measure overall job readiness in, in terms of literacy and numeracy and attention to detail and, and things of that nature, okay? And, and, and again, I, I wanna say again, a lot of these things do measure uh, very, very specific things. Now, it's important to realize that, you know, particularly on, on what I was just talking about, like kind of the, the, the micro skills tests, they're, they're not designed to predict long-term job performance. You know, um, uh, now most of the, you know, the app to the personality tests, yeah, that's long-term stuff. The, these uh, micro skills tests, um, they're an indicator of the person's current skill level in certain, you know, key competencies, okay? And so I wanna wrap up what I've been talking about by emphasizing and emphasizing, you know, strongly, test for several of these things. Don't just go for soft skills. Don't just go for functional skills. And, you know, um, you know, behavior, past actions as an indicator of future behavior, interpersonal skills, how they've interacted with people in the past, those are sort of the more softer things. But then also the functional skills are the concrete technical knowledge that they have, um, you know, uh, uh, how do they, you know, they, they process information, all of these uh, sorts of things. So I really do think that you, you've got to look at, you know, all of that. Now, more as a reference for you, as opposed to talking points for me. My next four slides, I'm just going to touch, I'm not going to go over all of them, but I would urge you at your leisure and, uh, you know, in thinking about, do I want to, you know, um, you know, contact some of the uh, test providers and, and so forth. Uh, what, what am I looking for? What, what should I be, you know, thinking about that's relevant to my own environment? So am I interested in deductive reasoning. And again, I, I, I've got several slides here on these different points. So deductive reasoning, and what is that? Well, it's the ability to apply general rules to specific problems to produce answers that make sense. Uh, am I concerned with oral comprehension, the ability to listen and understand information and ideas presented through spoken words and sentences? Now, for some of you, uh, and, and again, let me use a real simple, easy example. If I've got a customer service rep, um, you know, uh, e either coming in direct face-to-face -face contact with my clientele or over the phone, yeah, they better have good oral comprehension. But everyone, honestly, <clears throat> if I'm hiring a night custodian that basically is going to work alone in a building, you know, uh, for, you know, hours on end, um, this really doesn't make that much difference, you know, uh, as long as they can comprehend what it is I, uh, I need them to do, then, then you know, the rest of it, hey, you know, who cares? And honestly, I, I know that some of you have, you know, some, you know, individual uh, needs um, different than others. And let me, let me give you an example, once again, from my own life experience. Um, 
once upon a time, a long time ago, I was a part owner of, but I was a managing director of a fitness center. And um, uh, I hired uh, someone who had some uh, mental uh, disabilities, some mental challenges. And um, uh, he would learn how to do a job, but then he would forget on, on how to do it. So we ended up taking a series of photographs of him doing different tasks and we put him into a photo album. So if he forgot how to do a particular thing, uh, including by the way, running the washing machine to wash towels at night um, and, and how we wanted the towels folded and put away on, on the bins and all that, there were a series of pictures where he would go look through the photo album and then he would remember how to do the task. And so uh, again, the, these various things that I'm, I'm trying to bring forward here really think about it what what is important to your own environment what should you be testing for you know what difference does it make and how would that translate into success or failure uh, for uh, a new hire so there's problem sensitivity information ordering manual dexterity um, uh, general knowledge complexity uh, complexity would be the nature number variety intricacy of the different the tasks steps processes all of those kinds of things what about the physical demands? Now here, be very, very careful. Again, we, you, if, if you're gonna say, must be able to lift uh, 25 pounds, that better have some relevancy to the job in question, or sure enough, you're gonna have an adverse impact primarily against you know women. And I'm not trying to be misogynistic or et cetera, et cetera. I'm not trying to be anti-women uh, uh, on this thing. And so, as I say, if, if legitimately no kidding, um, there's there's the repetitive need to physically lift 25 pounds over the course of an eight-hour shift or whatever, fine, put it in there as a job requirement. But if it's not an essential thing, boy, I sure wouldn't do that. So be careful with these. Be careful with these. Also work environment. Um, I had a client, it was a, a big food service company, <clears throat> and they had a lot of turnover uh, in the uh, coolers where they had, uh, you know, fresh vegetables and stuff. So the temperature in there is like in the mid thirties and all that. And so constantly the people in there had runny noses and on and on and on. Interestingly though, they didn't have much turnover in the freezer. And then we realized the problem was that in the freezer, we gave people these wonderful freezer suits and, and uh, mittens and, and, uh, 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 insulated boots and and all sorts of stuff. They were just as toasty warm as could be. Well, in the cooler, it's whatever the person happened to have in their closet, you know, sort of, you know, come as you are to, to work. And so people got tired of having the runny noses and the coughs and all the rest of it. And so when we began to provide, uh, you know, uh, better clothing for them, um, including pants and, and what have you, then all of a sudden the, uh, the uh, turnover, it, it didn't stop entirely. But um, uh, but it, it it certainly got cut down. So the work environment is a big thing as well. Now these various things that I just showed you, you can find a lot of information to help you kind of focus on two free free uh, websites uh, that are run by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. There's the ONET online system, and then there's the Occupational Outlook Handbook. They're both free, they're run by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the primary one I'd urge you to take a look at is the ONET online system. The government took 900 different uh, jobs and they broke them down into skill sets, competencies, et cetera. And uh, this is easy to research on, by the way. It's, it's you know, the, the search engine is easy to, to work with. And um, it, it lays out a lot of these things to help you focus your thinking on, okay, what questions should I be asking? And everyone, that leads me to one of the most important parts of this presentation. It's what tests should I administer? That's where I've been building up to. What, what tests, you know? Now, you know, what, what skills, what abilities, what traits am I interested in? Well, to do that, to figure that out, you need to do a job requirements analysis. In other words, you need to take your, your job descriptions, first of all, make sure they're up to date and they actually are reflective of the job in question. And then you need to break it down to do that task that, that's in the job description. What does it take, right? What abilities are associated with that given position? That will then lead you to the questions to ask whether, you know, or to, to you know, get from the, the uh, test providers and, and what have you. And the test providers, and I'm going to use our sponsor's um, uh, material here as, as an example. The, 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 you know, 
eSkill and, and others again that, that, that are the provider of these things, they uh, have deep dive tests that look at these various and sundry uh, skills, uh, both the you know, personality stuff, the functional skills, and what have you. And you can go from an overview, kind of, kind of the uh, um, you know, profile of going from the more general down to very, very specific individual questions and you know, how they're worded and all of that. So there are subject-based tests, there are job-based tests, and again, a lot of this can be combined. And the test providers, of course, have you know a whole battery of people ready to help you. Once you've, you've given them the, the, the profile and what have you, they can actually then help you figure out which tests do I actually use to get my desired outcomes, all right? Now, earlier in my presentation, I verbalized strongly that um, you know that there are you know a lot of different uh, types of tests and they do have to be validated. And uh, by the way, you know something. I, I need to pause for a moment because I'm afraid if I don't say something uh, again. I, I said this earlier, but I want to say it before I I go into sort of the more technical aspects of some things here. These pre-employment assessment tests are not a crystal ball. All right. Anyone that tells you that you'll never make a hiring mistake again um, is not being truthful. And uh, that um, you know our, our tests are 99.9% .9 accurate and all this stuff. Everyone, they're very well done. It really, all these providers have done a really good job of coming up with good, good science-based uh, you know, testing, what have you. But you know, listen, there's gonna be mistakes, all right? And that's why you don't just use these tests as the end all be all. It needs to be part of an overall you know, system where uh, you are looking at resumes, you are interviewing live, things of that nature. All right, so again, um, be, be realistic. They're wonderful, they really are, but be realistic. All right, as far as validity measures, the government years ago, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, came up with what are called the Uniform Guidelines on Employee Selection Procedures. Uh, and um, the, the, these things talk about criterion related validity, construct validity, and content validity. And all of the, the not all, I shouldn't use that word all, most, all right, most of the test providers now have validated all of their tests using these various things. And in, in, in recommending to you use this over something else, they will refer to this. So criteria-related validity refers to a statistical relationship between test scores and the actual job performance to show that it, it, it is, yeah, that, that really is real. Construct validity, it's the relationship between something believed to be an underlying human trait, something, again, that someone, you know, most people act in a certain way or have this certain trait, all right, and uh, how that relates to this specific job. And then content validity measures how well the subject matter actually relates to the specific job in question. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on my next slide because I've already basically, you know, talked about it. You need to have some way of establishing benchmarks, cutoff points, and, and what have you. And really, administer the test to your current employees. And that sets, that, that's how it's going to let you uh, set your minimum cutoff scores. And as, as strongly as I can say this without being melodramatic, don't just test your top performers. They're your top performers for a reason. Of course, they're going to do great. Test everyone in a given position. Now, that's the best way that I know of to end up with some sort of valid benchmark, you know. And you know, you know, annual performance uh, uh, appraisals. You know, <clears throat> there's a, there's almost a tyranny that comes with almost any kind of a rating system. Uh, the simpler ones, you know, um, you know, poor, uh, you know, average and superior are terrible because you've got someone who's doing a, a good job but not what would anyone would say is you know superior or something and then you you mark them as average and you hurt their feelings they, they show up every day they do a good job for you been with you for a number of years and all you do is give them a rating of average so you know how you set the bar on these things really has a, a real uh, you know impact on existing workers uh, and and also you know what what your expectations are and so again if your expectations are set against only your top performers you're in for a lot of turnover because people are going to disappoint you 
good people, people that come in, as I say, do a good job every day. It's just that they're not, uh, you know, like a rock star, you know, and what have you. Okay. That's how you would set the minimum scores. Now, I would test early in the process. Um, uh, I would test remotely, uh, you know, I let people, you know, do this stuff remotely from home and what have you. I've already uh, mentioned there is a danger in unsupervised, unproctored remote testing because someone can, uh, you know, bring in a, you know, a ringer, if you will, and have them take the test for them and, and all that. And so, um, you know, do let it be known uh, that uh, there, there could very well be, uh, you know, retesting, um, you know, for uh, applicants who made it through the initial screening. Now, if you're going to do that, do that uniformly across the board. If you don't, truly, I'm, I, 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 I mean this so sincerely, you're going to have charges of discrimination levied against you. What will happen is people will say you're being selective, that you're only uh, retesting people that have a Hispanic surname, or you're only retesting women, or you're only retesting people that are over 40 years old, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so if you're going to retest one, retest all. And again, that uniformity, okay? Now, other legal considerations, uh, uh, you know, let's talk about those. Um, these tests have to measure people specific to the job in question. You can't measure people in the abstract, all right? Uh, the Supreme Court has actually ruled on that back in 1977, I think it was. And so there, there, there has to be a, a link between. And the requirements of the job have to be job-related and consistent with business necessity. Those are magic legal words, if you will, all right? Now, because of that, if you will do that, then in fact, you're going to be fine because then you won't run into the problem of the adverse impact. Okay. And by the way, there's a lot of common selection criteria that do in fact often have adverse impacts. All right. Uh, it's like minimum educational requirements. It's like there was a famous case where, uh, and I'm not going to mention the case name. There's no reason for me to to in essence disparage an organization, but there was a Supreme Court case where an organization said you had to have a high school diploma to even get an entry level job there. And the uh, organization's argument was we're not trying to discriminate, uh, we're just trying to raise the educational level of, uh, of our group. And <clears throat> a certain group said, no, 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 we've been denied educational opportunities in the past and we have the basic skill sets to do the, these jobs. And, um, you know, this arbitrary requirement of having a high school diploma uh, doesn't measure anything really having to do with the job. And the Supreme Court, that's when they, they, they ruled that, hey, um, it, you know, it, the job has to be, uh, the uh, requirements rather, do in fact have to be, you know, related to the business itself and based on business necessity of the job itself, all right? Uh, by the way, in that case, had the organization been able to show that a high school diploma was a proxy for a skill set, in other words, if they had said, you have to be able to read at this uh, uh, grade school level, do math at this grade school level to have these specific jobs, then, 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 yeah, then, then the diploma would have been valid. Uh, having a high school diploma or a GED would have been a valid proxy for the skill set. They couldn't do it. They lost the case. All right. So there, there are those things. Um, last couple of slides here deal with the Americans with Disabilities Act, and really, this is just a reprise of what I've already said. I would like for you to read it, though, uh, please, because again, it, it talks about what I, what, in more detail, what I've already mentioned, that on a pre-offer basis, you cannot, cannot ask the question, verbally or in writing, the answer to which would reveal that they have a, the person has a disability. Now, if you've offered a job, conditionally, uh, conditioned on them passing a test that's valid, measures their ability to do the job and so forth and so on, that doesn't have an in adverse impact, then in fact, then you can do medical tests after that. Now, you can do a medical examination only after, only after the conditional job offer. And then once again, I've got some information that I really, I, I knew at this point in the webinar, uh, we'd be coming down the home stretch here. And so this is for your reference. All right. Well, everyone, we have a minute or two left. I want to repeat what I said earlier that um, if you uh, stay with us as long as you can, please. 
but if, if you have to leave us and you have a question uh, or you think of one later in the day, uh, email me, you know, max at maxmullerassociates.com. And uh, if it is a specific question about these, these tests, uh, costs, um, uh, so on and so forth, please contact our sponsor, all right? Now, having said that, uh, again, if you can stay with us for another minute or two, uh, Ty, if there's some questions, I would do my best to answer them. Great, thank you, Max. Do you have any questions? Please submit them in the chat box for Max, and I will read them aloud. And the first question reads, you mentioned personality, aptitude and skills test, but didn't say anything about integrity test. What are your thoughts about those? Okay, um, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, just to kind of set the stage for my answer, l let me remind you, aptitude and skill tests, they're, they're an objective way to evaluate uh, you know, a candidate's knowledge in particular subjects and software their ability to perform specific tasks and all of that. And then of course, personality tests, um, you know, allow you to discover, you know, unique uh, qualities and character traits and all that. Integrity tests are in fact pre-employment assessment tests that give you a chance to ask, uh, you know, an applicant about key behaviors, all right, in the past and issues that could have adversely affect your business. In other words, the questions in these tests focus on honesty, drug and alcohol use, integrity, and a, any propensity toward anger and violence, which of course in these days of, you know, active shooters and, and the work-related violence and things of that nature, all very, very important. Now, uh, I didn't purposely leave this out, but you really do need to be careful with integrity testing. Um, uh, because uh, uh, many, many states now have what are called ban the box laws. And the box refers to on a lot of the old fashioned, old style applications, there is a box that says, have you ever pled guilty or been convicted of a felony? If yes, please explain. Well, um, and, and I'm, I'm about to say something that sounds like I'm being discriminatory and I'm not, the, the, this is, uh, what I'm about to say is based on government studies and um, on the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission's guidelines on background checks, all right? Statistically, uh, there's a higher percentage of uh, people of color uh, uh, that have been incarcerated. And so uh, even though uh, the question is seems neutral on its face, you're asking any applicant, hey, have you ever been convicted of a felony? Um, it has an adverse impact. And so these laws, which are also called fair chance laws, basically say that yes, eventually you can ask someone about their criminal background, but not on the front end. That that and and they're, they're all a little bit different. Some of them say um, you have to wait until you've done your first screening. Some of them say uh, you have to wait until you're you're actually going to you know interview the person. You, you've granted them an interview, uh, and and so on and so forth. So even in the, uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, most liberal states, if you will, all right, uh, small l, um, uh, that, that are the most protective of uh, employee and applicants rights and all that, all the states do allow, you know, eventually ask about a criminal background. It's just where in the process, you know, in, in under that state's laws, do that come in? Now, not all states have these, but more and more states are adopting them. All right. In addition to that, uh, in some states, um, it is all right to say we do not hire anyone that smokes uh, or uses uh, smokes uh, tobacco products or uses tobacco products, chews tobacco products, uh, and and what have you, and that's legal. But there are also a number of states that have what are called lifestyle laws, and lifestyle laws say that an employer cannot take an adverse action against a, an employee or an applicant for their off-duty, off-premise something, all right, in their lifestyle. Many of them deal with tobacco products. Others are a little more expansive, and they say that, it, uh, that you can't take an adverse action against someone for their use of any lawful product. Then there are a few states, uh, there's uh, uh, 
let's see, New York, there's uh, North Dakota, there's California, Colorado, where their lifestyle laws are very broad. And they say that you cannot take uh, an adverse action against someone for their off-duty, off-premise engagement in any lawful activity. Now, all of these laws do have some exceptions where, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to get get into a lot of detail here, but there are exceptions to all these things. But again, because of these lifestyle laws, you'd have to be careful that if you, in fact, because of uh, healthcare costs, um, your own corporate uh, culture, uh, what have you, you don't want to hire someone who smokes, um, you, you need to be careful uh, if you're going to do an integrity test or whatever, you need to be careful um, on what you use and, and what, what you're, you're, you're uh, you know, uh, asking about and, and, and what have you. All right. So there is that. Now, um, the final thing I'll say about that is, listen, um, if you're going to ask someone, uh, uh, you know, an integrity type question, ask everybody. All right. Comments, questions, and anything else uh, from anyone, Ty? No, Max, that was our last question. And as Max had mentioned, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to him via his email address. I'll let him state that again with his closing remarks, as well as if you have any questions about eSkill please uh, refer to the contact information on the screen. Max, I'll talk to you for closing uh, remarks. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, truly, it's very much appreciated. I hope there's at least one or two good uh, takeaways, uh, you know, uh, from the information. Um, if you have not used any of these uh, assessments before, uh, dip your toe in the water. G g give it a try. I, I think you're going to find that... Uh, that uh, really, it's uh, it, it's re they're really very good. They're 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 worth the money. They're worth the effort. And uh, I think you'd be uh, you know pretty happy with the your, the uh, the ultimate results. Okay, listen, join us again in the future for another HR morning uh, session. And um, my best wishes to everyone. Thank you, Max. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. On behalf of HR Morning and Esco. This concludes our program. Take care.